Tamam. Just, I, don't, I don't know what the hell's going on here. Well, call the woman. Wes, I tried. She's not, she's not in the office. She gave her cell phone number. I doesn't make any.
Hi, John. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. I can, I can. Oh, uh, let's see who else is there. Um, Tom Flynn. Here I have. I'm thinking you're Wellfleet Zoom one. I guess so. <laughs> it um, looks like John Dwayne may be on, but muted. Okay, well, somewhere I have his number. And Tom Flynn, I, I heard he joined, but I was playing around with the thing, so I may have thrown him out. I see him on mine as still on, but. Yeah, I'm here. There's John. Yeah, this is John. the worst time of day for me because I got the sun blaring in at me here and I can't see my computer screen. We can't see you either. You can't see me either? Nope, you have, to, you have to start your video. I did. I thought I did. Oh, that's right. I didn't, did I? See, that's what I can't see. Uh, let me see. There you are. There I am. We got gotcha. you. Yeah. Well, why can't I get myself? Uh, well, we see your screen. So, yeah, this must be your uh, home screen, huh, John? So I think you've shared your screen, but why we're not seeing you. Well, that's all right. You know what you, I look like. You move your cursor down on the bottom. Um, do you see a, an icon in the bottom left for start video? No, let's see. It would be below your toolbar. Yeah, well, I don't see any of that. You I know what you're talking about, Laura, and I, and I actually had it earlier and then um, I got to tell you that, you know, it, it, unless that there's some kind of maps or something we're going to be looking at, which I also, I, I know I, you sent me the, the Wellfleet map. Tom, Tom, yeah, Tom Slack, unmute yourself. Oh, wait. Uh, He's, Tom, oh, I think he did. Hi, I'm here. I just finally got here. Yeah, well, it's not easy, baby. <laughs> I don't know that. Oh, there I, you are, looking super tropical. Uh, I can't see anybody or anything. Yeah, there I, we go. I got everybody on the right side of my screen. I don't know. All right. There's a way to play around with it where you can make the faces much bigger. I just, it doesn't really matter to me. So, you know? so if you move, if you move your cursor up in the right hand corner, yeah. Some speaker view options. Upper right hand corner. At least that's what it is on mine. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. The problem is, is I can, you know, it's so sunny in here right now. I can't see and unless uh, unless there's something I need to look at, like a map, for instance, um, which John, you can open up on your computer, apparently. I'll be able to see it. Um, the only thing I'm seeing is someone's uh, uh, Mac screen. Yeah, I think that's John. I think it's, be John. Yeah, John Rails. So you could go ahead and put that Map 41 up on that screen if you want, John. But um, I'm perfectly happy. I, I had two phone uh, conference calls today. And, you know, other than not being able to look at everybody in the group, it just, let's just treat it as a conference call. You know, we're not looking at any maps, right? Um, well, the, you, might, you might be looking at a map, but it's something I've already sent you. We actually yeah, have it. Yeah, I, I, I see Tom Flynn's name here, but I, I, can't, I can't figure out how to get him in, into, the, into the conference. It says, make host, make allow record, rename, put in waiting room. <laughs> Usually when I get in a situation like this, I just start hitting stuff and that's probably not um, Do you put them in the waiting room and see what happens? I don't know. Um, oh, now, now, now it says admit. Yeah. Well, that was you brilliant. Want to, you want to admit. And it says joining. Let's see if he shows up. And then I don't know where Jim is. And he was anxious to. All right. So Tom, if you're there and you can't, you're not getting through to us. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Tom. 
You're talking about Tom Flynn. Yes, yes. I'm about Tom yeah. Flynn. Yeah. No, I hear you, Tom. Slack. <laughs> okay. John, if you wanted to open your um, the agenda document, we'd all see it on your screen or any of the others. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can do that right on your computer. Just click any one of those. If you've got it on your screen, you can do that. Says, Good thing you're not looking at my screen. Who knows what you click? It says that Tom Flynn is joining, but I, I don't know where he's. This is why we have a test run. <laughs> I, I'm seeing something down at the bottom uh, of the uh, three pictures uh, screens that I'm viewing called Wellfleet Zoom. People mm -hmm. see Anyone know what that might be? That's John, probably. Oh, it is John. It's the other John. Can you see us up above that? Yeah, I, I'm I called, well, I'm, yeah, I'm called Wellfleet Zoom for the for the purposes of the meeting. Okay. <laughs> I see Laura and John and myself, and that's it. <laughs> I get. I get the sense that Tom is trying to join, but he can't. I gotta tell you, if Tom can't figure out a way to join and he can hear us, he could call my office and I can put him on speakerphone. Good idea. I just came in off the bay from fishing and I'm going to take a two minute break. <laughs> You've been on the bay fishing. I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> we caught 13 fish and not a single one was legal. So, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> hey, I just, uh, I'm going to send around a link to all you guys in this group. I, uh, with these webinars and everybody's doing things by webinars that somehow I got Conservation Law Foundation sent me a uh, a link to a webinar they did like yesterday. I think I missed it. But you can look at the video now of the webinar and it was about the Gulf of Maine. And hmm. there was a guy from National Geographic. And of course, National, you know, it was some incredible photography of stuff in the Gulf of Maine. So I thought it was a neat way to look at some of the different kinds of things people are doing with, with webinars. I was more thinking about it for the, uh, the Wellfleet Harbor Conference. Spalding Rehab. Is that yeah, you, John? Well, yeah, well, I'm trying to look up. I've got um, Jim's you, phone number here. If you got his phone number, I can call him on my, on my speakerphone here if you want. Uh, why don't you do that? His his mobile is seven seven four. Yep. Seven two two. Yep. One four four six. <laughs> I don't think so. Now he's probably, the head's about ready to explode. Your call has been forwarded yeah. to an automated right. voice message. He I'll may be trying message. to do the Zoom seven, on his phone. Seven, four, seven, oh, that looks like he's in. Two, one, four, yeah. four, 
is not available. It looks like Tom just got in. Oh, please yeah. When you finish recording, you may hang up or press one for more options. Hey Tom, it's John Duane. I guess you're hopefully joined our meeting here. If you have a hard time joining our Zoom meeting, you can always try to give me a call here at my office and I'll put you on speaker. It's 349-7800. Thanks. Is he in? His name's on the bottom of the screen on mine. I don't see his name on mine. Yeah, neither do I. It came and went. Huh. He probably still went to pick up the phone. He's still on mine. Huh. Well, I left him a message. We'll see what he does. Mm. Well, Laura, is there anything you can do with his box? Well, you're not the moderator, so you can't. It says he's connecting to audio now. Oh, all right. There you, hey, Tom, can you hear us? Tom Flynn? It doesn't look like, it looks like it's trying to connect. Hey, Tom Flynn, are you there? I don't know why it's having trouble connecting. Yeah, but. you know, well, I got to say, if you don't use Zoom ever or often, you know. If he's doing it on his cell phone, they have a much harder. You, you, and yeah, you have a hard, for, for me, I'd never be able to do it on my cell phone. It would be very hard for it, me. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking at a 46-inch monitor right now, and I can see the buttons, you know, but they're still pretty small. I just renamed myself. Well done. You're getting. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, mastering the art. Are you on a laptop, John? Yeah, we're looking at a screen. It, it oh, says, yeah. it says well, that my, my audio is. So now you have to. Put I, it says your video. That my, I can't figure out how to turn my camera on. Uh, well, is, is your laptop open? Is the whole thing open? Oh, it's yeah. Open. I've used, so, I've done Zoom. I've been a um, participants before. I don't know. Normally, there's a button that says "Connect with Computer Audio," and then I you wonder if to... you need to stop sharing your screen to get the icons to come back at the bottom. Although you right. should, you're should looking on the bottom to... left and see if there's a button. John. You should Where be able move? to just move your cursor around and have them appear on the bottom. Right. If you move your cursor down, there you the are. Bottom, you did it. There he is. Hello, John. <laughs> but now I you can't see you. <laughs> yeah, well, you're probably limited. Is Tom Flynn on yet? Well, there's some. There's some symbol like he's trying to call. Well, why don't we just let him? I, I don't know. Wait, you can just continue to wait for him. I'm not in a hurry, but if you want to start the meeting, I don't care. You know. Mm. Mm. So let me look. Show up as a participant. Yeah, he's probably the problem is he's got a cell phone and that's it, you know? I think so too. So, John Real, if you go up to the top of your screen and the yeah. right, you usually can set how you see it. There's a little thing called view options. And then there's also the speaker view. Tom, we can't hear you, but it looks like you're trying to talk. No, John or Tom? Hey, hey, oh, now Tom. we've got you. Now we've got you. Oh, I just heard him. Yep, that was Tom Flynn. Yeah. Can you see us, Tom? I can see you and I can see Laura. I can't see anyone else. All right, well, you're on now. At least we can hear Who else do you need to say? Enough. I got my, you know, I got yin and yang. You know, I'll be okay. <laughs> All right, we got you. Tom, can you hear me? This is John Real. Yes, I can hear you, John. Hi, good to hear you again. You sort yes, of it's been a long time. <laughs> you kind of disappeared on me for a while, and I didn't know what had happened to you. Oh, I had all kinds of issues, but we won't go into that. 
All right, good. And we'll leave it at that. I don't know where Jim Falcon is now. Well, before Jim Falcone gets here, you sent me a map, John, but you didn't tell me what parcel it was, so I have no idea what I was going to be looking at there. Well, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain that shortly. So it's map 41 uh, and it's parcel something, and I just couldn't, you know. Yeah, no, I'll, exp I'll explain what, what we're looking at later. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Jim was not, I'm going to open the meeting now. Try to get something done. Uh, Jim was not at the meeting of December 11th, so we have a, a we have a quorum, which is four people. We've got five, and I would like um, uh, a motion to either modify or approve the minutes of December um, 11th of 2019, which I think I sent around. All right. Did I make a correction on them? Just a spelling correction? I don't have any record, John. If you have a few corrections, uh, I would suggest you just um, mark up the yeah. copy and, and send it to me and I'll make the corrections. All right, I thought I did, but uh, anyways, it could have been another document. I'm looking for it again. Yeah, I don't know if it was the minutes or if it was the agenda. I think it might have been the agenda. So I don't, I don't know that I looked at the minutes. I probably should have. I looked at them. They looked right. I didn't see anything un untold. Tom, hmm. would you like to make a motion to approve then? Uh, I'll start the game. Uh, I'll move that we accept those minutes uh, from that date. I'll second that. All in favor. Any discussion? I don't hear any discussion. All in favor? Yes. Favor. Okay. Aye. If someone sees some small corrections, uh, just email me. But we'll let you we'll know. Take, we'll take that. The other, I was going to run these these bits of business uh, early in the meeting anyway. So um, each year we uh, we have donated uh, three hundred dollars to the Wellfleet Harbor Conference, and I would like to ask the committee to do that again. The Wellfleet Harbor Conference, as it's been held, is not going to exist this year um, because of the the uh, COVID issue. What what there's going to be is a series of online seminars in in November, and we've got some good speakers and some good topics. Um, and uh, but I'd like to be sure that we've we've made our donation. Um, if we don't make it now, uh, next Tuesday at midnight, the money disappears because it's the end of the fiscal year. Let's make it. So I would, I need a motion and a vote. I move we make that donation. I'll second it. All in favor? Yep. I. <laughs> yeah. The way that these, when you're doing this by Zoom, I think it helps if you go person by person here. Do that. Okay, you're right. So John Real says I. John Duane. I. Laura. I. Tom Flynn. Aye. Tom Slack? Aye. We ended up in the same place. There we go. <laughs> the, the next thing is uh, John Duane has um, uh, written a number of important and useful letters to support fisheries conservation, and particularly around the Menhaden issue, but also about the herring. And we have generally operated um, under a procedure where he is authorized to write letters for us. He, he circulates them around before he sends them. But very often um, the um, opportunity for these letters appears between meetings and I wanted to be sure that we were represented. So I just thought it would be useful to reauthorize John to do that. 
And um, we welcome a motion to that effect or further discussion. I would move that we proceed with that, as you stated it. I would need a second. Would, okay. John, I think one thing we're going to have to do um, to, to dodge the open meeting law is that the, the letters have to come not from NRAB, but from members of NRAB because strictly speaking, we're supposed to put these sort of things in, in open meeting and have open discussion where we don't have the time for that. So I think we have to change the format a little bit, but that, that's a small point. Um, yeah, but then aren't we, if we're saying members of NRAB, how's that happening if we're not supposed to be meeting outside of an open meeting? Oh. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, yeah, you're, you must have been trained as a lawyer. Well, make uh, <laughs> singular. It can't, it can't be all of us if, uh, you know. Right. Let's just leave I it. Would, the way, let's let's sure, get that idea. Coming. We'll just leave it the way it's been. It's worked. Well, because <laughs> all right. Because one of the topics I was going to bring up, as long as we're talking about this now. Yeah, I was just on a Menhaden call today. There's this Menhaden coalition I belong to. Right. And, you know, I got to say, it's full of folks from all up and down the East Coast, the Audubon, to Nature Conservancy, Chesapeake Bay. I mean, there's a million different organizations. And they're all, everybody's calling from somewhere, except for this guy, Patrick Paquette. I don't know if you guys know him at all. No. He's a fisheries guy here in New England. He's a... Uh, He's the head of the Mass Great Bass Association. Anyways, he's a fisheries advocate. That's all. I think that's all he does for the work. Is he's a fisheries advocate. But you know, every time I introduce the people on the phone call, they're always saying, you know, uh, Chris Moore, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, blah blah blah, from the Nature Conservancy, whatever. And it's John Dwayne. So I was hoping that if, if you were going to make me the fisheries guy, I could say John Dwayne, Wellfleet Natural Resources Advisory Board because that's how I'm generally signing letters anyways. Um, so that poses an interesting, you know. I think here's, an, here's another way to solve the problem. You, you, you will be John Duane in our AB. We will, we will do the, um, if, if there's a sense of urgency and there almost always is, we will, you, 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 you send out the letter, we will, vote by mail, and then at our next meeting, we'll formalize it. Well, I, I get another idea. How's this? Yeah. Because we're allowed to talk. We're not supposed to talk about substantive stuff between meetings. Well, but if you're going to nominate me to write about everything to do with fisheries for the NRAB, and I sent you a letter that was about fisheries for the NRAB, and... All you're doing is looking to correct any spelling or typos. My understanding is that doesn't violate the open meeting law. So, and if there ends up being, if, if you've got a problem with what I'm writing, for whatever reason, you can just say, forget it, we'll talk about it at the next meeting, and I'll either write a letter personally without Wellfleet on it, or I can send it on behalf of NRAB. Okay. You know, I hope that didn't get too complicated. That's what I'm thinking. Because that's usually sense. what happens anyways. I send it around, you guys say it looks good. I'm usually pretty good about spell checking, but mm -hmm. as long as it's fishery stuff, and usually it's Menhaden or Herring or something like that, uh, that seems to me a way to get around that. Any objection to that? Sounds, Sounds good reasonable. to me. Mm. Okay. You gotta think but then about it. Yeah. If he wants to keep the job. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe I, you know, when I bail on an RAB, you can find somebody else. But, um, <laughs> you know, the bottom line is it does help to have that town of wealth with letterhead whenever I send things in, because that's how it shows up when, right. you know, when, it's being, when things are being commented on. And uh, it's always pretty much, I mean, you got to think about, first of all, who's going to object to it? Who's going to say that I'm so pissed off that you didn't, 
you know, let me uh, uh, participate in this herring letter or eel letter. You know, I, I have a feeling we're, we're probably trying to do the right thing, but at the same time, I don't think open meeting law is going to be an issue with this thing. Well, I think the motion should say that we authorize John Duane to act as fisheries advocate for NRAB. Um, there you go. To, in a way to implement our concern for fisheries uh, conservation. Yeah. I'll second. Well, somebody else second. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, John Real says aye. John Duane? Aye. Laura? Aye. Tom Flynn? Aye. Tom Slack? Aye. Okay. All right. right. So, the, so the idea is, is that there's going to, first of all, there's going to be a meeting coming up in August about Menhaden, and it's a pretty easy letter. It's just going to be a real short one. However, I will send that around to you guys in a couple of weeks, and just, uh, the idea being is if I ever send something around and you're, maybe you don't like it. You know, I mean, like for instance, I do send out letters on like for Herring River restoration. And if there's somebody on this board that may not like it, you know, you gotta think about that. So just be aware that when you see a letter of mine, I'm always gonna send it around just like I've been doing before we, uh, before I click send to whoever the authority is and just tell me if you got a problem with it and I will solve it. Okay. Um, Lieutenant Island access issues. Uh, I met with uh, Jim Falcone the other day and we spent some time looking at some places on the island. I think Tom Flynn will remember it because a lot of this goes back to the old Coastal and Pond Access Committee. Um, and there are four, four issues, and I'll try to explain them. This, this is NREB acting for coastal and pond access now. As you approach, you're going out to Lieutenant Island, and this is, this is on map 41. And as you approach the bridge, on the left-hand side, there's a parking area, and there's a, a, a roadway or a pathway that leads out to the left, that is to the south. And Have you already crossed the bridge? Excuse me? Is that after you've crossed the bridge or are you still before, on the main? Before you cross the bridge. Okay. And um, that pathway that crosses Mass Audubon property and is much used by uh, shell fishermen, wild pickers. And That's the trouble is that the road is considerably being degraded by uh, shell fishing trucks going down it. And so Jim has raised an issue that he, we, we need to get the Audubon Society and the shell fishers together about this issue. And hey John, yeah, is that because it's like marshy over there, or is it because they're no, it's, too, it's, too, it's too, because it's a sand, a very sandy road, it's a totally it's, unfinished. It's all right, I know it's just a right. secure road, so it's getting not really, up. All right. not really a road, it's a pathway across sand. Well, let me ask well, you this is it the kind of sand because I've never been down there where you should technically lower the air pressure in your tires, probably. Is that what's happening? Is it getting like whoop de doos You know what I mean? Like well, there's there's a big there's a big dip in it as you it it uh, the the trucks have dug a little hole in the in the roadway. All right, just one one hole. Yep. Huh. So the 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 so it, clearly this sort of um, de environmental degradation is a problem. I, I fully support the shellfish. Mass Audubon know, knows the shell fishermen go down the road and approves of that. They don't have a problem. But I, we've got to find a way to get it fixed. And I told Jim that I would take the responsibility of setting up some sort of a communication between Audubon and the shell fishermen. 
um, societies. Nancy Civetta. So th this is just for information. Um, <coughs> if you wanted to, you could go out to Lieutenant Island and see for yourself and we'll, we'll discuss that at the next meeting. The second place is now you've crossed the bridge and you've crossed the, you, you've crossed the causeway. And again, on the left-hand side, there's a road called Way 100. Yes. It's before okay. you go up the hill, right? It's before you go up the hill. Yeah, I know. All right. You know. And that, I, I checked with um, uh, Nancy Vale, who's the, the town um, assessor, assessor, and that, that's a private road. Same problem exists. It, and and it, here is, you, you, the shell fishermen are degrading the road. But the Audubon is involved now. The people who, who are involved are the private abutters on that road. So I, I, agree, I know one of them. And I will talk to that person and say, is this a concern? Um, do you plan to, to maintain the road? Um, but it's something I, th I think that the, the private abutters and uh, uh, the shellfish department should uh, agree upon. John, is this where the, all the turtle hatching is going on or, or turtle nesting? Just as you get across, you just cross the bridge at the very end of the bridge and to the left along the shoreline there. This, I don't this, know, if, I guess that's I, not yeah, that's, that's the road, that's one. Uh, yeah. Tom, are you talking about a, a location before you go down the causeway or after you go down the causeway? After. Yeah, that's the same, same thing. Okay, they call it turtle point or something out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a third issue, and op opposite Way 100, the, there's a, the Lieutenant Island Road is shown as bearing off to the right. Yes, that's the legal road. That, that, fair enough, Tom. Uh, the point is it was blocked off in uh, oh, about 10 years ago by the Audubon. And what Jim is, what Jim told me, Tom, is he, he personally didn't mind it being blocked off to, to protect the landscape, but he wanted to, it's blocked off at one end by a split rail fence and at the other end by stones. And he wanted the stones to be replaced by a split rail fence so that in a case of emergency, uh, people could get out. Well, I agree with that. But the big problem we had with maintaining our, our uh, ownership and right away on that road was that it was almost impossible to physically maintain. It was generally, it's, it's, it's generally underwater uh, with the tides. And uh, so it's, it's become unusable. Yeah. I said this would be just for an emergency and maybe I, I thought what, I would do is there's a ownership, there's an owner's society out there on Lieutenant Island, Lieutenant Island Owner Society. And I try to find out who was the chairman of that and see what the owners, the owners out there thought of it. Because if they're not concerned, um, I would be inclined not to be concerned myself. Hey, John, can I, would I, can I ask you which road are you talking about now? You're talking about as you go over the causeway. You're over the causeway, and the um, there's a you're road on the that's island labeled Lieutenant Island Road that bears to the right. Just as you cross the causeway, there's a split there. Yeah, I know. And you, if you make a right, you can stay down below. We're thinking that. Yeah, yeah, it's that it's that low road that that I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Tell, think of where the telephone poles are. I thought they blocked that off with rocks. They did on one well, end. But John was saying, yes. But it's a split rail fence on the, on the east end. Mm, okay, the end that's out near the boathouse. Yeah, no, right. no, the other end. That, uh, out near the boathouse is on the west end. And <laughs> the rocks are down there, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's, that's where the All rocks right. are. And what Jim was saying is we should raise the issue of whether those rocks should be turned into a fence um, for emergency purposes. Yeah. Keep in mind, keep in mind, please, 
that the road that we actually use to go over Lieutenant's Island on the on the east side of the island there is actually a private road. The only public access is that road that is now blocked off. Hmm. That is legal. Really? Yes. That that road that we all drive on is a private road. Oh. Yeah, but that yeah, means... I think I, I think I knew that Tom actually. And uh, Yeah, you did. I know. But the but the, no it's it's it it's privateness is not enforced. Well, it's private, but that means the homeowners association, everybody that's, a, that's in the homeowners association, anybody that owns property back there obviously can use it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, if it's open, so UPS is it? open to you, but you have no claim on it. The, um, the fourth issue is, is not on the map, but it's by far the biggest issue, and I told Jim, I was going to kick it down the road. If you if you go down, all the way down uh, West Meadow Avenue, and till you reach the south shore of the island, we call it we used to call it the, the southwest corner. Um, there's a there's a very nice swimming beach there, and the the problem is that lots of people drive there to go swimming. And Jim told me that over the past weekend, he counted 32 cars. <laughs> the park on the mar I mean, the, the, the only parking there would handle about five. So you had cars parked all over the place. And that, that's a very serious um, <laughs> potential environmental issue, among other things, safety issue, among other things. And um, I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle it, but we got to get a bunch of people together to see if we can find a solution. Are you talking about that wicked, rutted up road that goes down to the left? Yes, and it it's actually repaired pretty well now, John. You could actually oh. drive down there now. Yeah, it's not too bad. Oh. All right, well, maybe that's why there was all the cars down there. But you know, we we used to do uh, uh, piping plover counts down there. And some of the local property owners would be up in arms if anybody parked down there. So I don't know what's happened. But. Well, you would think you you think if they were upset with one car looking at piping clovers, the thirty-two par cars on a beach would be a bigger problem. <laughs> Noticeable. <laughs> well, uh, but obviously. A final, a, we're in REB, so we're, we're, we want to maintain the access, but do it in a way which is, is consistent with good conservation practices. But obviously, we also have to take into account what the, the, what the local owners think. So uh, we're going to have to contact some of them. We're going to have to contact Audubon because they're involved. The town is involved. It's well, a much more right. complicated problem. Right, because the town owns that property at the end of the road, right? Yeah. There's, there's town ownership there. There's Audubon yeah. ownership. There's the owner, yeah, ownership. on the other side of the road is Audubon, and one side is the town, yeah. Right. But if you're going to make more space, more parking, you're probably going to get everybody involved. True. Or, yeah. or, Tom, you have to come up with a way to limit the number of cars. Well, what's Audubon got to say about it? Don't know. I, I, I need to talk with Melissa. Well, yeah. And the, hey, there, that, there used to be uh, more parking further down that road, which has been blocked off by a fence or stones or something. So uh, I think <laughs> Audubon did stickers? that. You're right. There's an odd piece of private property right at the end between the Audubon and the town. Did, did the cars have beach stickers? I mean, are these wealth leaders or are they? <laughs> this is not a wealth beach. beach. It, no, I know it isn't a wealth beach. I'm just saying, is it people who would be otherwise going to one of the beaches who are finding their way out there? Or is it just tourists who are don't even have a beach sticker on their car and have found a place to 
I would guess, Laura, don't know, but I would guess that 90% of those cars come from the island people themselves. And they just- I agree. And they okay. just can't be bothered to walk over. Oh, wow. right. Got it. Well, you know, and you maybe have, you know, a couple of kids, a three-year-old, a five-year-old. Right. You, you, that's what you're- A bunch of stuff do. to take. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So, I mean, right. I'm not, uh, so I, I think we've got three issues, which I kind of agreed with Jim, I would take a lead on. And one big issue that we have to think about again. And hey, can uh, I ask you who Jim Falcone is? Yeah, he's a, he's a shell fisherman. He used to be <laughs> with Tom Flynn on the old um, Coastal Pond Access Committee. Yeah, his name's familiar. I probably know him. I just don't know who he is. He does, does he own property out there? No, he lives um, on the um, east side of uh, Route 6. All right. Huh. But, you know, he's taking a lot of it. I'm sorry, he's not here. It's a shame because he's take, he was the one that took all the initiative to get me uh, a feet on this. Right. I was glad to see him stepping up. And um, I, I, I could be a... I could be sort of, I, this last issue is interesting because um, you do have a, a significant environmental risk at the same time that you, you, you'd like public access and, and how to manage that is, a, is, a, is something I don't know right now. Uh, can I ask you who, who went out there and fixed the road? I mean, that, that road does not fix itself. Somebody must have gone out there and raised that, it. That was done by the local residents. So, can I make a suggestion? I mean, it's nice to pay attention to what's going on out there, but these the Lieutenant Island Homeowners Association, or somebody that represents them, should be the ones complaining about cars out there. You well, know, I mean, when I, you say I, Jim, I, was Jim Falcone shellfish out there, is that? Do you have a grant out there, maybe, or? He used to. He, he, he right. was over on the boathouse side. Because that's one question I would ask when he, now he would know when he went out there, whether it was low tide or high tide, because if it's uh, high tide, they're going swimming. But if it's low tide, people are going to be, shell nobody's going to be swimming out there at low tide, if you know what I mean. Right, but shell fishermen do use it. But there's only, at, at low tide, there only be one or two trucks there from shell fishermen. The, well, what the... Yeah, what the local no. owners think is important, but what what really triggers me is if you got people parking on on marshes or or other otherwise vegetative um, areas, that's a that's a, a an environmental risk, and we, we have to, we have to yeah. address that as well. Well, I seem to recall. I don't know whether it was this board or the shellfish board, but. I seem to recall that that road that goes out there, when it gets wet or when you have to go around a certain spot, you're actually going on Audubon property. And that's actually, you're right. And that's the way the road actually looks on a map. It goes right across the Audubon property. Right. And so I don't, I think that, uh, you know, Melissa may want to weigh in on this. And absolutely, I, you know, that maybe I don't know if that's because that's a concern that I think we had years ago was, you know, do you want to make people go farther to the right or the left? I honestly forget which way it is, or do you want to say, let's just let them go across the Audubon property like they've been doing? You know, that's I, a good point. Do we want to force the traffic back onto the actual town road or the, the, the surveyed road? But you're right. What happens is once you get down to 11th Street, the road goes out into Audubon. So, I mean, you know, Melissa, I mean, I'm sure the Audubon would say, well, you've been, obviously we've been using it that way. If it's going to help, keep the road layout where it's supposed to be by staying on the Audubon property. And it's, that's the proper way to do it from a natural resources perspective to keep, keep things good out there, then we should try to keep it that way. Ah. And get, get written permission from the Audubon to use their land, you know? 
And again, it's, I don't know whether that's the town that should be doing that or if that's the Lieutenant Island folks that should be doing that. Um, I almost had my, to, my thinking had to is we to bring the whole thing up in, in a town meeting, in a town board, to tell you the truth, you know? I mean, unless there's some concern about things really being degraded out there, you know? Well, if you've got 32 cars parked out there, something's being degraded because they're not all parked <laughs> on the road. I, um, maybe I overstate the issue, but sort of my thinking is somehow if we, if we can do it, even with masks on, we have to have ourselves and Audubon and some of the landowners um, and maybe um, Hillary, because there's, she's, she's the environmental law around town, and, and look and see how bad the problem is and, and is there a solution. May may not be a solution without getting nasty. <laughs> Let's move on. We, I want to get to the harbor management plan. I just had I, I had an item called access to restored Herring River. Here, here's the issue. Some of us are very interested in kayaking on the Herring River. I've been from the current dike all the way up to Route Six several times, <laughs> and the way the project is being set up now. There's a there'll be kayak landing at uh, at the new dike, but then there are no plans, fixed plans that I'm aware of for anything further upstream. And there 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 is a, a people there's a put in for kayaks at uh, when the road crosses Bound Brook, and there's another yeah. put in for kayaks actually right at Route Six where the river cr crosses Route Six. And it turns out that the mechanism for trying to get something to happen is with a guy called Jeff Sanders, who's head of natural resources at the seashore. So I just wanted to, to say that uh, two things. One is um, I, I plan to talk to him about trying to get these kayak accesses uh, continued. And two, if any of you have any other ideas about um, improved citizen access to the river uh, as the restoration takes place or when it's done, let me know. I would be glad to include those in the conversation. <coughs> as you know, I'm not a big fan of the, what's uh, the uh, Herring River recreation, but I do believe that your points are really salient. And I think that those access points should be kept open. They were traditionally there, and I think that they, if they're going to be raising the water levels up in there, it'd be very advantageous to keep them open. Yeah, and I, I think I think Tom that I, I've got a strong talking point because I'm not talking about creating new access points. I'm talking about maintaining the current ones. So am I. I was just talking about recreating the river. Yeah, I know. I understood. You know, we, we've agreed to disagree on that one, so that's okay. Has, hasn't that come up in the planning yet by somebody? No, not that I know of, and that's why I want to talk to Jeff. Um, that's surprising. We're actually ready to talk about the harbor management plan, and I, I'm, uh, there's several ways we could, could do it, um, but I thought Maybe John, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd start with the, the Curly Report, and I'd like you to update us about that, and then we can have some discussion about um, what should be in, in that chapter of the report. Uh, all right. Um, so, yeah. So I can tell you that. Uh, you know, for all of you who don't know Owen Nichols from Cape, uh, from Coastal Conservation up in Province there, Center for Coastal Studies up in Provincetown, uh, is doing something for Friends of Herring River. Uh, and it's, it's uh, I don't even want to really tell you exactly what John, really, you might know more 
about what's going on, what he's doing for Prince Van River. However, um, I we've been going on and off with him about doing a revision of the Curly Report, and he was very enthusiastic about it. I think you guys all know what the Curly Report is. It's that study of the marine resources of Wellfleet Harbor that was done back in 1972. So he was all thrilled and enthusiastic. Um, I just got a letter from him, an email from him finally, that he's going to put a proposal together for us. And I sent it around to you. I believe I sent it to everybody. You did. And um, it sounded like the only thing that I thought when it just going through my head, and I did not look at the Curly Report, but is the only thing that was missing was anything about birds, which I'm not sure we care about anyways, or they can have <laughs> done some other, you know, some other way. I think he pretty much covered, he was talking about doing otter trawls, you know, the, he's not doing any of this with the Don Palladino Fellowship. He was doing basic benthic studies. And he was talking about a year long study of the harbor. So first of all, uh, which is what I thought when I heard about what they were paying to have the study done for Friends of Heron River, it was it's like three or four thousand dollars is what I heard. I could be wrong about that, but that's what I heard. And this is gonna be way more than that, obviously. Right. Yeah, well, so there's and one of the things is we had talked about in the original Curly report, at the very end when it comes to recommendations, one of the recommendations is Let's do a follow-up every 10 years of this study. So he was talking about designing it in a way so that you could do a follow-up, but the mechanics of that were going to be worked out. He hadn't figured that out yet. So that's my main concern about that, is how are we going to replicate this every five years or every 10 years without it having to cost $100,000? You know what I mean? And or more, I don't know. You know, I'm waiting to see what the I'm waiting to see what the Center for Coastal Studies comes up with for a proposal. He's going to come up with costs, so that's what we're waiting for. And uh, he says it's going to be soon. I don't know how long it's going to be. However, in terms of including that in the harbor management plan. Um, it almost seems to me like the Curly report redone should be the harbor management plan, if you know what I mean. You know, for those of you who have read it from beginning to end, it's pretty much, you know, it's, it's it lists from A to Z everything that's going on in the harbor, what the current state of the harbor is, and what they recommend for the future. A whole boatload of recommendations that were probably too many of them, like we had thought about some other things that we've done. Let's try to make it a little bit more simple, but when it comes to how to incorporate that into the harbor management plan, that's going to be pretty ambitious. Very true, but wouldn't it be nice to have that, to make that data available so that you could make a coherent plan? And, you know, you're right, It's but it's it's so comprehensive, the original is. I don't know how we would duplicate it. Well, so, you, you, they, it comes down to money, you know? I mean, I think that, first of all, the original harbor, so aren't we supposed to do a harbor management plan every 10 years, all right? In principle. Yeah, okay. So, um, and obviously, it's been man, 14 years now or something like that. Um, um, yeah, 14. Yeah, and the bottom line is, I don't know that, I mean, first of all, I don't know who would do that. I mean, we, are we supposed to do that, the Natural Resources Advisory Board? I think that's taken on a lot. And that's one of the reasons I think it's been 14 years is because it's, it's really ambitious to do that. And- Bruce, grant, grant you do what, to make a harbor management plan? Yes. So I, I'll tell you the reason why I kept punting down the road is because in the, um, the the 2006 Harbor Management Plan, there was, a, there was a key recommendation about dealing with nitrogen issues. And that kept not happening. And I didn't want to do a new Harbor Management Plan and just repeat 
the previous one and say we ought to do the nitrogen thing. Well, uh -huh. the nitrogen thing is beginning to move along now, so this is a useful timing to say, well, what's next? Okay, well, uh, John, so, okay, well, so, here's, well, so what do you think about the concept of, I mean, because we're not going to call it the Curley Report for forever. The next one is going to be another report. You know, we're not going to keep calling it Curley Report version one, version two, you know? We could but call it the John I mean, Dwayne Report. Yeah, call it the John Dwayne. I don't think so. Um, hey, I'm, not, look, I'm not one of the authors. <laughs> let me... Uh, let me look at, I've, I want to look at this in a slightly different way. I, as I, I have in front of me a table of contents of what's actually in the Curley report. And the first big characteristic is physical and chemical characteristics. Yeah. Geology, salinity, dissolved oxygen. Well, it turns out that there are people from the Center of Coastal Studies, Amy Costa and Mark Borelli, who are already working on this. So we don't, it, it's already underway. And then there's the, the fin fish, which Owen has started to work on. Maybe not in a way that we're completely happy with, but that's what the contract he has with the Friends of Herring River is about. Yeah, but he's only doing fin fish in the river, obviously, right? No, no, it goes into the harbor. Well, how's he going to do that without otter trawls? And, you know, you, you need to, you can't do that with just beach sands. <laughs> I mean, is that what he's, I don't know how he's planning on doing that. Am I wrong about the price tag? You know, the price tag is 3000 Yeah, so I don't see how he's going to possibly do, use otter trawls with, and that's where all the fish are. I mean, let's face it, all the big fish, they're, they're all out there. Well, maybe I better go back and, and read it again. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think that, I don't know what he's doing with Friends of Herring River. I, I, I kind of think we should keep them separate. Okay. And, and I don't know what the goals are for Friends of Herring River, but um, I think that in terms of the Natural Resources Advisory Board and a harbor management plan, uh, I think it could e the Curly Report could easily, if the, the town had a, a Curly Report every 10 years with, you know, making it a little bit, you know, tweaking it around a little bit, that should be, or it should, the, curly, the new Curly Report should be our harbor management plan. Well, I think what you're saying is it's a good baseline for where to to see where the harbor is evolving. But then we have to just add what our steps are for dealing with climate change and plastics and all those other topics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Someone's, someone's phone ringing? Not me anymore. I forgot to put mine on mute though. If it rings, I apologize. No problem. The other thing, well, the, the other thing that's going in about fin fish is the, the Friends of Herring River has a herring count every every year, which does track the alewife population. Well, alewives are fine, and even striped bass. I mean, you could do something, but I'm, those are going to be fish that would be over at the uh, by the dike over there. But um, like when it comes to uh, other fish, like cod and things like that, that are in the harbor, you know. Um, again, I, you know, um, it, I think it would be helpful before we get too deeply into, I mean, like, in too deeply into what we're going to do with the curl, the new curly report. Let's see what Owen comes up with for us. You know, like a more detailed version. I, you know, if you read what he sent us, it did sound fairly comprehensive. Yeah. You know, doing really a real, it sounds like a year long study again. Well, John, it's your chapter, so lead, lead us on. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm quite well, happy with that. So, the, so, so John, so it would be available next spring? Is that the timing? Oh, yeah. Well, it's not going to be available until 2021 easily because it's, it's going to be – what it is is it's uh, – when you look at the uh, original Curly Report, I think it was done from June one year till July the next year or something. Okay. Or July to June. So it was 12 months with – Obviously, nothing going on, nothing much going on in the winter, you know, except for icebergs, but there wasn't much a sampling of stuff in the winter. However, the data collected was, did go through November and into December, and, you know, the comings and goings of fish, because that's what you think about, you know, what, what, 
who, right. what's coming, who's coming when, you know, what fish are here in the summer, which ones are gone. And, you know, so for me, it all started with all the fish that they sampled. I thought were, I was surprised at how many different kinds of fish. I was surprised at how many different kinds of fish there were. And, uh, you know, Tommy cod and all sorts of crazy fish that I never would have thought about. Um, so, uh, I don't know what you would want to do with that, you know, mechanically, how you would want to do it. Refer to the Curly Report in the Harbor Management Plan or did it have a chapter on it? I mean, again, I that thing. A, that, I think we should have a chapter on it and, and say, you know, this is what was in the old Curly Report. This is the work that's ongoing now. Yeah. And this is what we need to do in the future. Are we looking to get this harbor management plan done this year? <laughs> Leading question. <laughs> yeah, you started. Uh, it's I, good to have a goal. I think <laughs> we should. I think we should probably try to do that. The trouble we we really got set back last year because um, you know, Christmas time I went off to uh, Arizona and had a wonderful time. Um, but didn't do a whole lot of work about Wellfleet. <laughs> and I, uh, we're planning to go to Tucson again. So uh, I think we, we better try to make some progress. John, the one thing that is well, I can I want to wait till they put their masks on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, John, I <laughs> may want to take a year off from Arizona. Yeah, well, we're, <laughs> we're, we're nervous about to... that, believe me. <laughs> um, if I look at things on, on the table of contents of the Curly Report, that's really not being done. We have uh, no, I don't know of any information about the population of wild shellfish in the harbor. Uh, Nancy Chavada follows very closely what's happening on the grants, but there's a, a whole lot of harbor that isn't on the grants and we don't know what, what the health, what the health of those um, shellfish, Populations is. Just to hang up on me? Well, we don't technically have any wild shellfish in the harbor. I mean, they were all transplanted from somewhere. At one no, no, there's, there's wild shellfish around. Well, uh, you know, wild from the, the 1950 maybe or something, but they, um, my understanding was they all got wiped out around the late 1800s or something. Yeah, well, and, they've been re, they have been re, um, reintroduced. You're just talking about wild versus aquaculture. I'm talking about wild. Linda and I in the in the fall love love to walk around Great Island and on the south shore of Great Island there's some great oystering. And those are those are wild. Those are not planted. Now then some of the spat may come from from planted shellfish. Well they did. I, I, you know, I would say I could almost speculate for sure they do. Where else would they come from? There's a wild population that regenerates itself. Out on Great Island. All right. Well, maybe. I don't know. But you'd you'd have to you'd have to do some genetic studies to, to prove it one way or the other. Hmm. There there's also I was reading there's some fascinating history about shellfishing in um Wellfleet. Over a hundred years ago, there was a scientist called Belding who wrote some reports about it. So we, 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 we have a, a good base point for what, what things were like um, around 1900. And in the, the first harbor management plan, which is online for us, if you ever have a chance to look at it and read not the whole thing, but the start of it. There's some fascinating history about shellfishing in the harbor and history of the harbor. That's useful background. It's a, it's well written. But as far as in, if we're going to redo the Curly Report, we have we have to we have to do shellfish as well. Well, uh, y yes. I, well, not just as well. I hate to say it, but at this point in in the when you're looking at the state of Wellfleet Harbor. You know, shellfish are going to be taking up a large part of the new Curly Report, I would think. You know, I would think so, too. 
I mean, I first of all, yeah, okay, so think about what else was in the Curley report. There was at least a chapter, or I don't know, I don't remember how it was laid out, but there's a lot to do with economics. And the economics of the harbor right now are shellfish, period. I mean, that's where all the money comes from in Wellfleet Harbor is shellfishing. You know, you, you know, the marina certainly takes in money, but it's predominant. I mean, that's the predominant industry in Wellfleet right now. So I would think that that's going to be a main focus. And, you know, we've got blood art clams and blood clams are a new species relatively. Although people say they've been around for years, but we certainly haven't been harvesting them. I've um, never seen them. Yeah, I never saw one either until I heard about them a couple of years ago. And that yeah, was the first I'd heard of them. Um, another thing that's kind Point of... Point to make is that we have a good ally. This is not a blurb and a clack or a big support thing. We have a good ally in our current uh, wellfish, uh, shellfish warden. Yeah. And we're getting a lot more data and, and a lot more uh, uh, transparency on what's going on. And I, we should probably be tapping that source in, in, this, in, in the harbor management plan. I agree. Nancy, Nancy's terrific. And I, I, I thought of two specific pieces of information I wanted to ask her for. One is a, an update on the catch statistics. How much, how much is, comes from the grants, how much comes from wild. The other thing Nancy has got, Tom, is a list of shellfish access points. And I would like, like to include that in the report. I've got both of those things, actually. Well, that, then we're ahead of ourselves. Good. Yeah, I mean, she's, we, we put that together, and I, I was actually just looking. Laura mentioned she was looking for some stuff to do with shell fishing, so I was poking around. We've got an access point thing, although I don't know how accurate it's going to be. Nancy could look at it. but um, And what was the only landings I got from... Uh, last year when I did the Curly Report poster for the harbor. Um, I got all sorts of DMF numbers for landings and I got all Nancy's figures for landings. I mean, she's got them. So if you want a current one dealing up to like even last year, she'll have them for you. Okay. Um, the next section of the Curly Report is about marine vegetation, marsh life, marsh ownership and protection. There's an awful lot going on about that right now uh, because people are concerned about sea level rise and if the sea level rises too high, it'll flood out the marshes. There's a scientist at the Cape Cod National Seashore called Steve Smith who's done some really fabulous work about marshes. He's, 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 got, he's able to measure the height of the marsh so the marshes grow up every year. He's, he's able to measure how fast they are. He's able to see what would happen to the marshes if the sea level rise becomes too fast and, whether the, and the, the marsh is blocked from growing by the land behind. Uh, he's able to um, uh, look at vegetation changes in the marsh. Uh, he, he's done this work on the, on the marshes which are over on uh, uh, Lieutenant Island, but the but the methods could be used for all the marshes in Wellfleet, and I think that should be an important part of uh, the Curley report. Uh, maybe if we got some money, we could get Steve to set set that work up for us. The other thing that's important is the Conservation Commission has some special uh, regulations to protect salt marshes, and I made a note as to what, where to go find that. And of course I can't find my note now because I got so many notes here. Um, <laughs> oh, here it is. If you, if you go to the Conservation Commission, their <coughs> website and you look at their regulations, look at section 2.04 parentheses D. And it talks specifically about things to protect salt marshes. So there's, there's an awful lot we could talk about already in a in a report 
about salt marshes, and then we would have to go get some money to, to put in place the, these um, experiments, the, these monitoring for marshes like the Duck Creek Marsh or Blackfish Creek Marsh because the seashore didn't, didn't work on those. They, they were not seashore property. But the... St what about, uh, John, what about the eelgrass beds outside of uh, Great Island? I would love to have somebody explain to me <laughs> why there's a large seal, eelgrass bed on the outside of uh, Lieutenant Island, um, not Lieutenant Island, right uh, Jeremy Point. Yeah. Jeremy Point. Um, but, but not on the inside. Because I would have thought it, it would be easier to grow on the inside where it's, it's sheltered. It yeah. doesn't happen. I don't know. I think, John, I think one of the things is, if you look at Middle Meadow Marsh, that's hard to say, uh, but anyway, at, on the inside, which is, uh, we're, it's, it's losing its bottom. And I think there must be some kind, it's the same thing as we get in the upper Duck Creek. And I think the problem is we're losing bottom rather than gaining. And I don't know, I, I totally agree with you. It seems counterintuitive because the backside of Jeremy Point has much more activity as far as water movement. And what you would think it would be hard to maybe, establish. Maybe it's the size of the grains of the sand or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Because we're losing middle model marsh. It, the bottom is going down every year. And, and it has the same problem that Duck Creek has is that it's high behind it. So it can't, the marsh can't move inland. Yeah, so well, the bottom a, leaving. That's one of the things that Steve Smith wrote an article about. Uh, um, very interesting. So I think that's something else that we need, we need to have into our curly, new Curly report is to take advantage of the pioneering work that Steve has done and apply it across the harbor. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, so, you know, just to kind of to put a, you know, getting towards the end of the curly report, the, uh, I think we need to limit in the curly report the recommendations again, you know, like, like try to come up with uh, uh, some, you know, a trimmed down set of recommendations that can actually be achieved every five years or every 10 years if that's what we're going to do. And I, you know, my sense is going to be that to try to replicate this on a five-year basis might just be too much, you know. Yeah. I think that's going to all depend upon how much it costs. Uh, yeah. I think you're right. I, that was an ambitious pro project, and I don't know how we could read. Oh, I know. Uh, you know, Dan, you know, I, I remember talking to, to, you know, David Pierce when he was big at DMF. And they don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, it was like they said, forget it. You know, we, we wouldn't ever try to replicate something like that again. But everybody I've talked to in Wellfleet, and when it comes to science, if you want to have something you can compare to what the Curly Report did, you have to do the same kind of things, you know? Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, I'd be blown away if Owen comes back to us and tells us this is going to be under $50,000. <laughs> I would think that would be a big, huge win, but we'll see. And that's, you know, I probably shouldn't have said anything because I guess this is going to be available online, but uh, that would be like, I, I would think that would be, you know, you know, people have come up with all sorts of different estimates. I don't know if it's going to come less, but I would think that if it's, if it's less than that, I'd be surprised. But I think we ought to take some satisfaction, John, in work that's already going on from the Center for right. Coastal Studies, from, from um, Amy and Mark and by, by Steve Smith. If, if we didn't have those things going on, the price would go up another 30 or 40%. Well, I know the select board is in favor of it. We did meet with the select board and they said they thought it was a good idea. Right. Um, let me talk briefly about, since I'm writing a chapter on climate change, let me talk briefly about that. There are, 
there are about four things that happen with climate change. Uh, the, the, the water gets um, warmer, sea level, uh, the sea level rises, um, you get about 10% more rainfall um, out on the Cape than we're, we've had in the past and uh, much greater probability of storms. And the, what, we, what we have to do is to imagine um, what our response is going to be to protect the resources, the resources that we talk about measuring in the, in the, in the Curley report. Uh, if the sea level starts to rise too fast and tends to, to flood the salt marshes, um, there's a technology called thin layer deposition. You can you could put some dredge di diluted dredge material on the marsh and build it up artificially. And I think we've talked several times about trying to use um, the material that's going to be dredged out of the harbor, use it in a practical way. Um, a wonderful we need, idea. We need also, probably we're going to need at some point, some uh, barriers or reefs against wind erosion of, mm. of both land and marsh. That's so, another, that's the point. We've been lucky here in Wellfleet as far as wind erosion, but just go up to Boston Beach in Truro and you'll see what happens when the wind breaks through. Well, I'll tell you another place you can see. Dangerous and powerful thing. There's another place where you can see the, the growing risk, Tom. If you walk along the south shore of, of Great Island, from the point over toward uh, Middle Meadow, you'll see <clears> a lot of erosion on, the, on those slope faces there, the cliff faces. That erosion would not have been a, you wouldn't have seen it 10 years ago. So something has changed in the past 10 years that has accelerated the erosion of Great Island. And I assume that's increased wind and uh, storm attacking that face of the island. Well, the other thing you can see is in areas where the revetments have been uh, put in and the, all the scalloping and carving where revetments have not been put in. And I don't know how we, do, how we uh, deal with that. Yeah. <coughs> True. I think we lost the revetments issue. Mm -hmm. the, the private property rights um, uh, have uh, overtaken us. Um, Tom, had, Tom Slack, have you, Done any thinking about uh, a chapter on dredging? Well, yes, there's, there's a lot of information actually at the town website. Uh, if you go to uh, projects and to dredging, uh, there's, uh, you know, reasons to dredge. There's a report that, that was done in 2012 by uh, the Bourne Consulting Engineering Firm that Mm -hmm. Talks about analysis of uh, chemical analysis and things that were done down there. And uh, so I don't know, in our report from 2006, there's a lot of history, uh, uh, things that the wheel doesn't need to be reinvented. There's reasons for dredging. <laughs> but, but what we, we talked a little about this thin layer placement uh, and there's, there's been or thin layer deposition of dredge material. Uh, and there's been some good success uh, in places like Louisiana and uh, some of the Atlantic coast marshes. Uh, and there's a, there's a website that's put up by the Army Corps of Engineering that keeps updating this. It's called, uh, uh, well, there's a, it's a complicated website that I can send out if people are interested in seeing that. But, there are practical issues when it gets to Wellfleet, uh, like, 
you know, the getting a dredge in where you, that's close enough to the marsh area that you want to try replenishing uh, some issues with uh, the particle size and effects that they may have on oysters, uh, oyster uh, small oyster, uh, spat and that kind of thing. And and getting state approval, uh, John, you sent out something from, uh, I think, uh, was it the, was it Steve Smith or someone had looked into this and saying, uh, yes, it's a good idea, but we need to, uh, to, to cross that barrier with the state may be tricky. And, uh, and I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, uh, interest on the part of the current dredging committee on this. I tried to uh, get some information uh, to these people. And one of them just re just rejected my email, and the other one, other didn't respond at all. Yeah, I, I I think we've I think we've got uh, <laughs> good ideas, and it's a steep slope. I I, I yeah. agree. One thing I thought that might help, though, Tom, mm. um, I think. Um, Agnes Mittermeier talked to us about what the black mayonnaise composition was. Absolutely right. And uh, I, I don't know whether she's done a final report on that, that or not. I know you tried to contact her and I did too. Yeah, it's, it's the final report. Her, her boss is Mark Borelli and the final report is sitting on his desk. I'll have to, okay. I'll have to um, encourage him <laughs> to release it. Um, the, but the point of it was that this, from the from the dredging point of view, is this well? This is it's nasty, dirty stuff. It smells bad. There's nothing chemically harmful about it. Right. So right. if you wanted to to, to yeah. dilute it and spray it onto a Mayo Creek marsh, no problem. And I thought, Tom, one way, one thing that you might include in your thinking is that we should have in place a program to identify the origin of and test all of the dredge spoils that come into Wellfleet Harbor. Mm. Um, because the actual, uh, the, 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 one of the, uh, the guys that work every summer here and do the work for us, uh, Mindemeyer, was it, was the people that did the study? Yeah, yeah. And they, they found that it was, Pretty much the same organic material that was up in Mayo or Duck Creek. Yeah, right. It just, just it's not harmful stuff. Um, right. But I think yeah, if, we could, if we could, if we could, let's see. Um, I'll, 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 I'll tell you a story, and you sort of see where my thinking is going in the. From um, the Duck North, the, the, the sand which is on the beaches there gradually moves north uh, toward um, Truro. Mm -hmm. and some of it, of course, gets captured in Pamet Harbor, and Pamet Harbor needs dredging every every year. What the people with Truro do and uh, Pretty, pretty smart is they don't take that material and dump it out in Cape Cod Bay. They just put it on Cornhill Beach, north of the harbor, and it continues going on north <laughs> in Provincetown. So <laughs> there's already program in our next door neighbor about using dredge soils to maintain coastal, um, a coastal environment. And uh, if we knew better for all the dredge materials that come into Wellfleet Harbor, where it came from and what its chemical composition is, we might at least be able to put it back where it came from rather than take sure. it out of the heart yeah. of, of uh, Cape Cod Bay. Where did yeah, it Tom made a point. That... Sorry, go ahead. Tom made a point just a moment ago. And he was absolutely right. When I was on the ad hoc committee to buy a free dredge for the town to build of a certain size so that we could pump the, uh, do this thin layer deposition, that the biggest uh, problem we ran into was, was not the feds or not the locals, but the state. 
They just couldn't seem to understand how that could work. Um, well, I mean, it's a, I, I guess it's a, a ideas and goals to look at and, and to try to deal with whoever in the state uh, would be making those decisions and, uh, you know, as far as part of our plan to move ahead with at least just, looking at it. Yeah, you know, there's, there, but there's two, there's, there's two pieces of what we've talked about could come together. One we've talked about is, uh, is the growth of the salt marshes, the elevation of it losing ground to sea level rise. Mm. And that's part A and part B is, well, what's, what's in the dredge spoils? And if we put those two things together with some engineering that Tom Flynn could uh, advise us on the engineering, we've, we've, we've got a, a strong case. It won't go to the people, I know it won't go to the people now who are on the dredge committees. It won't go to the people who are on the uh, Marine Advisory Board. I, 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 I got a very cold shoulder, but I, I think it's something we have, to, we have to push. Okay, well that's certainly, is can be a big part of this report. Um, is something going on with Zoom because I'm starting to lose people. I still got the vocal, yeah. but I I just lost all the visuals. Well, I can tell you that one of the things with Zoom is they usually schedule meeting times, and if we're coming on to a I don't know how long we have this space booked for. You have, kind of have to book spaces on it. It's 5.30 right now. I booked it for two hours. Oh, so, all right. Well, so you, well. Laura, um, are you still there? Yep. All right. I yep. can see all of you. Yeah, okay. we're fine. It'll just, cut, it'll just go away. All of a sudden, at 6 o'clock, it'll shut off. Yeah. Let, let me then ask uh, John and Laura. Uh, we we want to have a chapter on shell fishing. And at the moment, I'm not sure what should be in that chapter. Um, I, I have s sort of an idea that as the temperature in the harbor goes up, uh, that's going to affect the shellfish. And it, I, I, I thought, well, we ought to know what, what's going on in um, uh, some of the places uh, further south from here, Barnegat Bay, Long Island Sound, uh, Osterville, uh, and how are the, where, where the shellfish are already facing warmer water than we have. Um, mm. But yeah. I would be very, I guess, John, because you're a member of the um, Shellfish Advisory Board, um, I know we had a good meeting with them last year, and then I've looked at the notes, and I, I can't, I can't extract from the, those notes a, um, a shellfish, um, a shellfishing chapter. I, yeah, I, I think I, I, I think we need your your help. Maybe. Well, I got to tell you, what, what what would the shellfish board like us to recommend? Well. Um, we don't have to agree with that, but at least it's a starting point. Yeah, I always ask them. We have a slightly new shell fishing board since then. You know, we have a new chair, and our membership does change. So, um, who's the chair now? It's Dave Seitler. Barbara, oh, no, he was he was the chair when we met with him. Oh, uh, really? Mm -hmm. All right. Was it? Yeah. Oh, that was yeah. That was that meeting we had in my office. No, yeah. this was this a meeting we. It was over, I think it was in the... Yeah, he was a member back then. He just wasn't oh, no, the this is the, he was the chairman. Oh, was this he? Was in, this was in December. Okay, well, that's, that's possible. Anyways, um, well, so what does the Shell Fishing Board recommend? What, uh, what would they I, I like to... tell you, I think that whoever said it before, Tom, uh, is right. Nancy Savetta should do the chapter on shellfish. I mean, we should pick her brain She's been she's been thinking nothing but shellfish ever since before she, she got the job. So um, she would be a good person to say, what would you include in the chapter? I mean, for me, being on the board for quite a few years, I would say there's a few species, blood clams, 
And there's some other ones that I never hear anything about really, which are razor clams, which I know still exist in Wellfleet Harbor, uh, but I don't know anything about them. But I don't see them anymore. And the other one, to tell you the truth, which is more of Cape Cod Bay, but surf clams, huge clams, you know, ocean clams. I, you know, I don't know if that's, uh, if it's, if they, to tell you the truth, I don't know if they have surf clams in, in Cape Cod Bay, but um, I'm just wondering <laughs> what, you know, what other kind of shellfish are there? I mean, we got green crabs, we've got horseshoe crabs. Um, so you tell me what falls under the purview of shellfish, you know? We talk about eels, we talk about all sorts of crazy things in the harbor. Yeah, but when it comes to just shellfish, blood art looking? clams, the state of the oysters and the, the regular eastern oysters and cohogs is pretty easy to figure out how stark the contrast is going to be. Um, between 50 years ago and now, I think I recall seven and a half percent of the shellfish landings were oysters 50 years ago. And that's obviously way out of whack now. So something's changed. And, you know, that's a big question I have. Why did it change so much? Well, oysters make more money than... But it's, oh, yeah. yeah, but if they were here back then, we still would have been landing them. There couldn't have been nearly as many as there are now. Yeah, but the but you've gotten much what more. What I'm looking for, John, is is what don't you think? I mean, this is this is a, when it was a month with R. And now people eat them all year round, and yeah. I mean, I'm looking. What what should we be recommending to the town to do that su supports shell fishing as a uh, sustainable? Uh, business in in Wellfleet, you know, it, it, there's been times when it hasn't been. Right. Well. And, okay. and I think I think going to talk to Nancy makes sense. Yeah. Well. We don't have to. Part... We don't have to accept what she says, but at least we ought to know what it is. No, no, no. I mean, I think that I mean, I'd be happy. I've got a good relationship with her. I'll be happy to yap away and see what she will pick her brain and just come up with some ideas. But one of the things I know is that. It's eventually what's going to happen is we're going to be moving into deeper water shell fishing. So that's what we should be thinking about for the future. I don't know how it's possible that Chipman's Cove won't be underwater at some point, you know? And um, it seems to me like I remember hearing about, I watched this show on PBS or something once about this guy out in Long Island that was figuring, he figured out a way to get the, get the heck out of commercial cod fishing because he wasn't making any money. And he was doing vertical uh, shell fishing in Long Island Sound that dealt with uh, layers of like the mussels were on the bottom, the clams were in the middle, and they were all attached to a rope with a buoy at the top. And he would harvest different ones at different times. And so that's maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that's in our future. You know, that's one of the reasons I think about the, uh, the eelgrass. I was thinking about kelp. Oh, I know that's what it was. He was growing green kelp out there. Some kind of kelp that apparently is, it's just a, a big seller. It's delicious, apparently. So he was growing this edible kelp in the deep water in Long Island Sound that he was getting, making a boatload of money from because it was so easy to produce. So, and he's a shell, he's a shellfish guy, right? That's what mostly he's growing a shellfish, but he's making money on kelp too. Let let's let's find out what Nancy would like us to support in in a report to the board of directors. All right. The last last thing that we've talked about in terms of the plan is coastal and pond access, and I I guess Tom, I'm sort of leaving that with you. I have a I had a couple of thoughts in mind. First of all, I'm, I'm trying to work with Eric Martinson to get a map of all the, the uh, access points to the harbor so that we, you can look at the map and see where the public can go. And the, we've talked about Lieutenant Island, but the other thing I'd ask you to do is think about where are the opportunities 
uh, either to protect or create access for, for, for people to the harbor. That's really what I'd like to see a chapter on, on coastal and pond access do. Certainly just certainly summarize to what we have, but to emphasize where, where things need to be protected, where there's some new opportunities. Tom still there? Maybe that's what, I don't know. Oh. I don't see him anymore. <laughs> yeah, I see him. Oh. It just shows the phone for him. I'll 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 send him an email with my pitch, so that's okay. <laughs> um is there anything else anyone would like to um issues to raise, comments, thoughts? Uh, I don't know if anybody uh, tuned into the Center for Coastal Studies harbor side or dock side presentation the other day, uh, but it was excellent. And they're doing a lot of stuff that we should we should probably or we've already talked about paying attention to. But uh, someone asked the question about uh, what's going to happen to Wellfleet Harbor with climate change and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the guy said, well, uh, the infrastructure can move, uh, wo uh, won't stay, and the coast will change. <laughs> anyway. What did, he mean, what did he mean by infrastructure? Well, the man-made uh, buildings and everything else that's there. But, but anyway, it's worthwhile uh, if you could go on Center for Coastal Studies and look at their website. I think they recorded this. Uh, the, the what they had Mark uh, Borelli was one of the speakers and the other was uh, uh, what's his name uh, octogenarian uh, Graham guys yeah guys mm -hmm. really really good guy and had a lot to say but but they uh, you know they're looking at uh, mapping uh, tidal flows and things like this uh, a lot of stuff that we're we've been discussing so. Yeah, along, along those lines, I caught something. I got it. I found it online. Actually, it was a. Uh, I'll send around the link to everybody. It was a uh, conservation law foundation uh, program on. It, it's hard to this guy Mark, and I can't remember his last name. For uh, he was uh, from National Geographic, and they did a really good presentation about what's going on in the Gulf of Maine. It was about the Gulf of Maine. And there was pictures of stuff about the province town with sharks. It was, it was fascinating. So I know the Gulf of Maine isn't exactly in Wellfleet Harbor, but it's, uh, it, was, it, was in, it was a great um, mix of mixed media that, that you can do on Zoom or on, you know, on a webinar that looked good. It was, it was a combination of slideshow, but he was being interviewed, and then there was participation at the end. So anyways, I'll shoot that around, everybody. So what I would like to do is, is hold another meeting um, um, three, four weeks from now in, in July, unless any of you have travel plans, which I don't. And I, I will do the a draft on climate change. I would like um, John to do a draft on the Curley report. Um, Tom Slack on dredging. Laura, I'd like you to to do the chapter on shellfishing. So I think when John Duane talks to Nancy, it should be both of you. That'd be great. I, and uh, it'd be. It, um, once you, you know, once you get to know her and she, she can be a big help and Tom Flynn, would you do something on coastal and pond access? See, see what Very good. I'll keep, uh, keep on that. That's right. And, uh, um, I will apologize to, to Jim. I don't know what happened to him. I looked, I looked to see if he'd sent me an email or, or 
uh, tried to get hold of me. I don't know what went wrong. He was, I had a long email from him this morning about uh, the Lieutenant Island issue. So he's certainly hoping to have joined us and um, it's too bad he didn't. Is there anything else before we quit? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, we've got some work to do uh, and hopefully by the time of the next meeting, I'll figure out how to, so we all, we don't have any of the glitches at the start, but at least we got something done. So uh, how you, we want me to host, I can send one through work too. Oh, oh no, but the, hmm. but the town I can't get it, has to that be, way. it has to be done through the town system. Yeah. It's a town meeting. It's got to be accessed. Yeah, because we, we're, we're being report, we're being recorded. You know, other than the hosting is something I've never done on this before, but this is usually pretty easy. You click on a link and that's it. And then, well, you know, that's, the only other thing is you have to find the microphone and you have to find the video connection. Uh, well, so there is a three step process. Courtney's instructions were, you know, nice, easy, one, two, three, four, and I got the three and it fell apart. So anyhow, have a good <laughs> evening, everyone. Thanks, John. All Thanks, right, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, bye now. Bye. Good night. Good night.